Hi, everybody. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Mohamed Moti, Professor of Hematology at the Sorbonne University. And uh, this is our now regular uh, uh, B-monthly uh, journal club by the International Academy for Clinical Hematology. Uh, this is supported by an unrestricted educational grant from uh, Takeda. Uh, why a journal club? I think I have presented this uh, to you uh, several times already. I think we all agree that the medical literature is really growing very rapidly. I mean, uh, obviously, in a couple of days, we will start the uh, ASH meeting, the American Society of Hematology meeting. And when you walk through or when you explore the program, it is amazing the amount of uh, novel data and results. But at the same time, despite the excitement, despite the new data, we would like to digest, to analyze these data and see how can all these data, these novel results, these new agents can fit and help to improve good clinical practice and state-of-the-art care. And one way, one successful way of doing this is this journal club. And we as a scientific society at the IACH we are extremely proud that we are, for the moment, the only society uh, doing this. And this is really proving to be a very, very successful uh, initiative because every time for every uh, article, we have hundreds and hundreds of participants and some of these uh, uh, journal clubs, we were above 1,000. Uh, listening and watching and asking questions. So here, something very important. This is highly interactive. So you can ask your questions using the chat. I'll do my best to uh, distribute the questions with the uh, panelists. Uh, so for today, uh, the choice was about of uh, this uh, uh, article uh, published on the 10th of November, very recently, in the journal uh, Blood Advances. Uh, this is a sister journal uh, of uh, the uh, journal Blood, the Journal of the American Society of Hematology. The title you can see here is about the real world evidence of uh, uh, TISA again leclocell for pediatric acute uh, uh, lymphocytic leukemia and non Hodgkin lymphoma. And uh, for the purpose of this journal club, I feel very privileged and we are very honored having the first author with us, uh, uh, Professor uh, Marcello Pasquini, who is the scientific uh, director of the CIBMTR. And we all uh, know the huge achievement and uh, development that were brought by the CIBMTR in the field of transplantation and cellular therapy over the last three or four decades. He's also a professor of medicine at the Medical College of uh, Wisconsin. So, Marcello, we're really very grateful uh, for you being here with us to analyze and uh, discuss this article. Uh, I'm also very grateful to Professor Christian Chabanon from the Institut Pauli Calmet in Marseille in France, who is also uh, a te cellular therapy expert, a clinical hematologist, uh, a, a chairman of the Cellular Therapy Working Party of the EBMT. And uh, both of them have accepted to uh, walk you through this article as part of this IACH Journal Club. So you can see here the abstract, the summary, and with blood advances, it is relatively straightforward, I would say, because the journal uh, provides uh, usually two key points. Uh, this study represents the largest set of safety and efficacy data for TISA. Please allow me to uh, say TISA because the name, the full name is difficult to pronounce. And outcomes in the real world setting are similar to result in the uh, pivotal trial. 
So uh, this was just to, for those, of course, who were not able to read the article in advance and to be able to follow the discussion, I'd like to highlight that this is in a non-interventional prospective study. Uh, these were patients who received uh, uh, this uh, TISA CAR T cell product for an approved indication, relapse refractory pediatric and young adult ALL or adult non-Hodgkin lymphoma after the 30th of August 2017 in the US or Canada. The clinical data were reported by the treatment centers to the CABMTR registry, and the main outcomes analyzed included the incidence of CRS, but also neurotoxicity, especially ICANs. They also reported SPMs, hematologic recovery, overall response rate, duration of response, event-free survival, progression-free survival, and uh, overall survival. You can see here, this is the table two from the article, and it provides a very uh, nice uh, uh, summary of the results comparing the uh, real-life non-interventional prospective uh, registry data. This is the CIBMTR column versus the registration trials, namely ALL, uh, namely Eliana, uh, which was the trial in ALL, and Juliet, the trial in non-Hodgkin lymphoma. And here you can see the main outcomes, especially in terms of efficacy when it comes to MRD negativity achievement, duration of response, event-free survival, overall survival, but also the different toxicities. So uh, this is about uh, the uh, article that we will be uh, discussing today. And now uh, I'd like uh, to welcome Marcello Pasquini and Christian Chabanon and invite them to the uh, discussion. And so Marcello, welcome. Christian, uh, good evening. Marcello, it's early for you, uh, early afternoon, I guess. I hope everything is okay with you guys. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Mohammed. This is a really a, um, honor to be here with you and discuss this article. I think um, um, we've been talking about the role of the registry, uh, working together with Christian and the team um, to uh, um, uh, because all these products are really global products. So I think this is really a big achievement for the registry to be able to collect data this fast and able to analyze and then compare the data that um, uh, was collected with the pivotal trial. So um, we're really um, uh, happy with the, how this is going. And um, I think one one piece of introduction of this is is that uh, um, as we we saw these CAR T cells being approved in the market. There was a requirement of following these patients for 15 years, and uh, so we. Uh, uh, I think this is really a very important role for the registry because uh, the regulators are really asking these companies to set up a long-term follow-up for these patients. And uh, if we didn't have a central repository for data, each company will have to create their own registry, which will be really very difficult to have this for the public domain and people to do studies like this one. Um, I think fortunate uh, we have a very good relationship with the companies so we could run the studies and add additional data that was not available in the registry, for example, the viability and the cell dose, which really is proprietary to the companies. Um, and we're able with this collaboration to do this. So, No, yeah. this is definitely a huge effort and you should be congratulated. Uh, and really commended for doing this. Just to uh, remind our audience, Christian, what are today the indication, the approved indications for CAR T cells in uh, Europe? But I think they are quite similar to the US. Absolutely, Mohamed. The indications are, are similar in the US and, and in Europe. And we have now three approved products. Uh, the first two ones were TISA, and I will uh, also use uh, abbreviations because of the unpronounceable names chosen by companies. So TISA is approved for the treatment of relapse and refractory B-cell acute lymphoblastic leukemia in children and adults um, below the age of 25 years. 
Uh, it is also approved for the treatment of uh, relapsed and refractory uh, diffused large B cell uh, lymphoma, and obviously uh, this uh, is uh, quite exclusively for adult uh, patients. And we do have a second product, uh, which is uh, called the Axi cells or Axi captagen cellular cell. Uh, this is also an autologous CAR T cells targeting CD19, and it is approved for adult patients with uh, diffuse large B-cell lymphoma or primary mediastinal uh, B-cell lymphoma. So, uh, Marcello, uh, and my role here as a moderator is sometimes to be sort of a devil advocate and be a bit provocative. I think for many years, and we as physicians have been educated that the goal, the standard, uh, in medicine is about running phase three randomized trials. And nothing else is uh, better than phase three randomized trial. But then now, and I think this study is a very good example, we can also see some very strong, very clean uh, real life registries and studies, uh, which can, I would say in terms of quality compete with randomized phase three trial, because we need to bear in mind that interestingly, and then I'll ask a question about his opinion about this, these products were approved without any randomization, just single arm uh, phase two data. So what are your thoughts about the philosoph, maybe it's a philosophical question about this issue of registry-based studies versus randomized prospective trials? Yeah, I think that's a good question. I mean, we, especially for the cell therapy field, um, and uh, um, I think there there are definitely advantages of a trial. You control the population, you control the the, uh, the intervention, and and especially for something that is approved already, um, there is a big impact of the uh, the real world evidence or real world data. And I think one of the examples was set forward by the FDA commissioner about a year ago. He was uh, uh, predicting that all these new products are coming down the pipeline. And uh, these products are live products, so they're going to change. So now the, the Kimraya in the past might be changed and the manufacturer may be improved. So what qualifies a new product? Are they going to go back and have phase one, phase two, and phase three? Or can we use these newer product, quote unquote, newer manufacturing procedures to basically approve that product? So he predicted that that could be a possibility uh, because there will be no manpower sufficiently to look at all of these all the time and, and to get the same approval process. As long as you have sort of some safety data, you know, there is really a, a, a big uh, impact of using the registry to answer these questions, whether this is really comparable or not. Christian, what's your, what are your thoughts on this issue of randomized versus real life registries? I think that in addition to the points stressed by uh, Marcello, it is important to, to remind that actually those two products were approved based on, on relatively small phase one, two trials, non-randomized uh, trials, because of the complexity of the manufacturing process, as well as the peculiar nature of the drug, which is made of, uh, again, human living cells get, that go through one or several steps of, of cryopreservation. So this is quite unusual. Um, both uh, medicinal products benefited from some special uh, approval dispositions such as fast track approval or prime status uh, in, in the EU, which allowed them for to, to get access to those special uh, conditions. Uh, it is also important to stress that despite all these limitations, there are phase three trials that are ongoing and recruiting patients, and that will address further questions, not exclusively on the efficacy and safety uh, of the drug, but also their relative role in the global strategy to treat those patients with advanced lymphoid malignancies. Obviously, the next question for those CAR T cells or whether or not they will come in second line treatment to replace the current standard of care, at least in lymphoma, which is uh, salvage chemotherapy and 
uh, um, um, high-dose chemotherapy supported with uh, autologous transplantation as consolidation treatment, and I think we will have the answer uh, in the uh, coming uh, months on these very important questions. And finally, uh, what the CIBMTR uh, in the USA and, and EBMT in, in Europe are demonstrating is that you can get uh, very relevant information from registries if those tools are geared up to collect adequate, timely, and, and accurate uh, information, and then you acquire information on a non-biased or non-selected population, including, for example, patients who had been infected with uh, hepatitis uh, viruses that were most often not allowed in the clinical trial. But if those patients develop, let's say, relapsed refractory lymphoma, why should not they get access to these drugs? So let, let, let me push a little bit further this issue, because uh, indeed, uh, in general, at least my understanding was that when you run a randomized prospective trial, you are a sort where you control most of the parameters and you are in an ideal setting. And then usually the results of the real world are sometimes or even frequently slightly less or slightly different compared to the ideal world. And we explain this by, as exactly you said, well, because we've been excluding this type of uh, infection, we've been excluding the uh, kidney failure, we've been excluding this and this. What has been really uh, surprising to me, and I was happily surprised, that was good news, it looks like that the results here in the real life are even slightly better than the uh, initial trials, for instance, it, it, when it comes to toxicity, for instance, CRS incident. Marcello, any thought on this? Yeah, I think there's a, some interesting aspects here. Uh, every time a product is approved, um, there is slightly drift on utilization of it um, because they are gonna be sold and then as long as they are within label, and the label is different than the eligibility of the trial. The label is much broader than what the trial did. So what we saw in the United States, at least for the other CAR T cell in the lymphoma, is that there was a drift of getting older patients. So the median age of those patients, the recipients are older, they tend to have more um, uh, comorbidities and they tend to have more um, uh, aggressive lymphoma, for example. And um, so, so that's one interesting aspect is that there is a drift and then, and then that changes the results of it. For this trial, I suspect that uh, specifically for CRS, as you mentioned, there are two relevant aspects. One of them is that the pivotal trial allow patients with a much higher percent blast coming in. And we know that there is association with high blast count and the severity of CRS. And so, so that was one element. The second element is that when you look at the patterns of treatment, we're very different. Patients were allowed to, to um, be treated um, uh, uh, with tocilizumab, for example, with the higher grades of CRS. And what we saw in the in the real world is that patients are uh, doctors are being treated in patients much earlier. They're not allowing them to get to grade two CRS and so forth. So I think there is a little bit of difference here. I, I was concerned about the this uh, as the capability of the registry to appropriately capture CRS because CRS is a new outcome. We're not really used to look at CRS, right? So, um, but when we looked at the axis cell um, and, uh, uh, you know, the, the data on axis cell it was much similar to it. So I think um, most of the data in this paper was really driven by the ALL. And I think the, the, uh, the blast percentage is probably what's, what drove that. So these patients are coming in with less blast than when we, they were, at least in the, in the Eliana trial. Uh, and there are a small number of patients in the Eliana trial as well. No, I, I think you're absolutely right. And uh, another important feature, which was quite surprising to me, uh, and probably in the U.S., there is a sort of uh, broader interpretation, I would say, sometimes of a label where even patients with MRD negativity, with an MRD negative disease, were included 
whereas you would imagine that this is meant to only to relapse refractory patients. So here uh, we have a question, maybe I'll uh, hand it to uh, Christian, uh, about uh, um, the ALL group and actually 27.8% of the ALL patient uh, actually received and failed a prior allogenic stem cell transplant. So in those patients who are in a sort of an allogenic hematopoietic system already, because I guess they didn't lose their hematopoietic system, if we have to perform CAR T cells, are we relying, are we going to use the lymphocyte of the patient, which are full donor chimerism sometimes, so, or should we go to the donor lymphocyte? I mean, maybe it's a silly question, but I wonder what are your thoughts about this? It's not a silly question. It, I would say it's an academic question because the, 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 the medicinal product as, as defined by health authorities and uh, pharma companies is made from an autologous collection, which in those patients who uh, uh, um, previously had an allogenic transplant is an autologous collection of donor-derived cells. But it's, it has been clearly demonstrated uh, in prior publications that you can derive CAR T cells from donor-derived cells. Now, the other option that you mentioned, Mohammed, is the possibility in the future to manufacture allogeneic CAR T cells, but these would be uh, uh, manufactured mostly from third party healthy donors. And the obvious advantage is, is that the industry would be in a position to manufacture small batches of off the shelf um, medicinal products thus solving the issue of the turnaround time which is a, which may be a pressing issue for for some of those patients with very aggressive diseases which is how do you manage your patients during the time necessary to manufacture your uh, medicinal product and get it back so, to so, your so, patient so, so, sorry christian my remark wasn't about using the allogenic car t cells which is another important topic but actually, if we have a patient who is in a full donor uh, chimerism for his lymphocyte, and you can go back to the same donor and get the lymphocyte and manufacture them to have CAR T cells specifically for the patient who was transplanted, I don't believe they're going to be allogenic you know, to the immune system mm -hmm. because they're going to be the same uh, lymphocyte. My speculation is that they're going to be healthier maybe or in a better shape compared to the ones that are uh, you know in the middle of the uh, leukemic cells or the uh, blast marcello what are your thoughts on this yeah that's an interesting topic i think we um i think we need to see this i mean there is a, a study that was proposed to to the cbmtr to look at the if you had a prior allo versus not, what is the effect of it? I mean, do you have more CRS? Do you have graft versus host disease? In fact, um, as we are discussing, I think one of these uh, manufacturers, EMA was very interested in that. They wanted to know what is the GVHD rate for patients with a prior allo, and mm -hmm. should we worry is this a, as, a, as a side effect, right? So I think um, uh, we don't have any data to support that. But you know, one thing I wanted to mention about prior allo was very interesting because when we, we started collecting this data back in 2017, and if we basically look by year, uh, the practice or in the United States has changed to the fact that the number, proportion of patients who have a prior ALO has decreased. So back in 2017, of all the, there are not a lot of it, but of all of them, 50% had a prior ALO. Now in 2020, less than 20% has a prior ALO, which tells me that when the patient um, really has refractive disease, they're not going to take them to ALO. They're going to use the CAR T cell as a sort of a, a salvage treatment before taking them to ALO. So it's really impacting practice. And the same thing we're seeing in lymphoma, and we're looking at the number of auto transplants uh, done for lymphoma as salvage, and those have been decreasing specifically for diffuse large B cell lymphoma. So the referral pattern is changing, so people are really adapting to it. So 
I think there's a reasonable question, but I think the, uh, it's going to be hard to answer if, if this pattern continues, you know, so less and less patients will have that. No, definitely. This is fascinating because I remember, I don't know if things have changed since a couple of years, but uh, uh, I think there is also the story what to do after CAR T cells in ALL. Should right. we propose ALO or not? The New York Sloan Catherine data were not showing a benefit as long as you can achieve deep MRD negativity, whereas the Seattle Fred Hatch data were more in favor of uh, uh, proposing ALO whenever feasible after CAR T cells. So uh, this yeah, is the, really fascinating. Right, I mean, I think that's a, a very active question. Now, the, the Chinese also say that if you, if you respond to CAR, you should take these patients to an ALO. So we are looking at this right now, and um, in, 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 uh, when we looked at the patients reported, we can see two trends that the, uh, the patients who, um, who receive an ALO after CAR, um, about a third of them would have relapse. And two thirds of them have no relapse in between. So they are called the, I don't know if you want to coin the term consolidation post CAR, you know, like you use the CAR to induce the remission and then you take them to it. So the question, do we need to take these or not, right? Um, so that's really an active question and we don't know the, the the answer, but we are seeing that some centers, like the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, are not offering routinely an allo transplant for these patients, and other centers will take everybody to an allo transplant. So I guess the, the jury is still out. Christian, what is currently the practice uh, in your institution? I I I think Marseille is a very active allo transplant program, but also CAR T cells. So what's currently your practice? What is the SOP, I would say? Yeah, well, we've, we've had very few uh, ALL because again, it's mostly uh, uh, for, for, for children. We've had one. Yeah. Uh, for lymphoma, as you know, there is a quite active allo transplant program in Marseille with Didier Blaise and uh, with a, a strong interest in offering allo for uh, lymphoma, which, which uh, we can agree uh, remains controversial. Uh, question. So uh, some of the patients with CAR T cells have been offered uh, allo uh, transplant following CAR T cells. If I remember correctly, I think one of them actually was able to 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 reach the point where uh, he or she was uh, transplanted. So we we. We have limited experience. It may be feasible in a small proportion of patients. Whether it is necessary, whether it is useful, needs further investigation. No, definitely. I, I think whether it's about ALO, as uh, uh, Marcello uh, mentioned, that questions I think uh, we in the academia, we need to answer this. I don't think the answer will come from the uh, whatever CAR T cell product coming into the field. And obviously for the auto part in lymphoma, we do have these ongoing randomized trial. And uh, indeed, you have mentioned this uh, in the introduction, Christian. We have a question here, which I thought is an interesting one. Unfortunately, we cannot uh, take all the questions because otherwise we can spend the whole uh, day, you know, to do on, uh, on this. Uh, the question is about that, uh, so I'm reading. Uh, we've been told that fludarabin cyclophosphamide is really the gold standard for lymphodepletion. And in this article, uh, in this series, some patients receive bendamustin for lymphodepletion. What are your thoughts on this, Marcello? Because I personally was also convinced that, you know, we can't do anything else, you know, that's how it is, fludarabin cyclophosphamide. And then, mm. Apparently, our colleagues were quite creative and preferred to do bendamustine. Yeah, this is very interesting because, um, as you um, probably aware, there was a lot of delays in manufacturing um, Kimraya to to get this back to the patient. So, um, as we started collecting this data, we really approached this as a, as a, as a conditioning regimen, right? So we say conditioning regimen. We know transplant people should be collecting that. And we, we had this sort of broad question in the forums, and then we start seeing some really odd things. And then we realized that people were doing um, these bridging therapies along with the lymphodepleting chemotherapy, uh, meaning that the, the definition of bridging 
is that uh, you do the leukophoresis, you submit the, the, the cells to the manufacturer, and then while you wait, the patient sometimes may have really very uncontrolled disease, and then you would do additional treatment to them, and then they report that as a lymphodepleting chemotherapy, which in essence could be, but not in the essence of the word that we're using, that's the flu side to, to do this. Now, um, when we clean all that, we still see a few patients who receive other therapies. It's important to note that in, in the label in the United States, uh, there is a prescribed use of that particular regimen. So I, that's why it's really a minority of patients are kind of going into other therapies, which I think that it might be people who cannot tolerate fluvarabine either because of the renal insufficiency or something other, and then they would approach with bendamustine. Uh, but it has been a question whether they can use bendamustine as lymphodepleting chemotherapy because we, we've been receiving inquiries. But when we looked at both products, um, Kimraya and Axicel, the number of people who get bendamustine is still very small. Um, so because, you know, the, the, in the commercial setting, it's still the product is linked to a, a lymphodepleting chemotherapy. So I think, you know, people are not going to be very creative as they are with conditioning regimens. So, Christian, uh, I think Marcello uh, alluded to an important uh, uh, obstacle we usually face, which is the time needed to get these CAR T cells ready, the autologous CAR T cells. And in highly proliferative diseases like ALL, uh, uh, time matters. Uh, did you notice, and I'm speaking maybe from a European perspective, and we'll ask Marcello about the situation in the US, did you notice that uh, uh, the time needed to get these cells ready is decreasing, or we are still we still need to wait for four or five weeks? Yeah, we still need to wait for somewhere around four to five weeks. Uh, maybe an important aspect, but given the period that's important to stress, is that first of all, we were still able to get access to CAR T cells despite all the events associated with the COVID-19 pandemics. Uh, and especially at the beginning of the pandemics, while most of the cell factories, the manufacturing sites were still in the US, uh, the companies still managed to get the product back to Europe when it was necessary. Next important point is that both companies uh, that market the two approved products have opened recently um, manufacturing plants in, in Europe, uh, in, in, in France, in, in, in the Netherlands and in Switzerland. So it's likely that it will cut down the turnaround time by a, a few days. Uh, but mostly what we expect in the future is that the companies will improve the manufacturing process. And Marcello alluded to the fact that these products will change over time and will probably change relatively rapidly as compared to a conventional drug that is manufactured through a, a chemical uh, process. So, uh, and, and we know that companies are, are working on improved uh, manufacturing processes that will cut down the time. They also work on the quality controls, which results are necessary for the qualified pharmacies to release the product. So it's likely that the turnaround time will be shortened in the near future, but we don't have the, date, the data yet in, in Europe. Marcello, how is the situation in the US? How quick you can get your CAR T cells? Yeah, so it's, uh, um, I think things are improving. I think for Kimraya, the, the, it, it decreased uh, quite a bit. Uh, the time, uh, we, uh, when we looked at the ranges of the distribution, you can see up to 40 days, and at 40 days is a long time to wait for these patients to get. Um, the time has been decreasing. They are having these more rapid and um, processes. For Yaskarta, um, it's also uh, two to three weeks uh, to get the product. Uh, when you look at the database, um, it, uh, it appears that about 20% of patients will get uh, a bridging of some kind between the leukophoresis and the infusion. So uh, that seems to be quite consistent. Um, and uh, we know that people who require a bridging, they tend to do worse, but it's basically just a, a surrogate marker of how bad the disease is in the first place. Okay, so we have a question here, uh, and maybe uh, I don't know who want to take it. 
what we are missing in the CAR T cell domain is, uh, is, is about the data on an intention to treat basis. So uh, can uh, the panelists comment on this issue and how these registries, whether the CIBMTR one, which is uh, the uh, which is the one which was published now in this article which we're discussing, or whether in the EBMT registry uh, that is ongoing, uh, how can we uh, capture this information? Because I believe there are some patients who are uh, collected, the lymphocytes are collected, and maybe CAR T cells manufactured, but never receives them, et cetera, et cetera. Or even they are referred, but maybe you couldn't collect the lymphocyte. Do you have such data, Marcello? Yeah, so this is a very important point because uh, we only know people who got the therapy, right? So we don't know the failures, the manufacturing failures. Uh, and, uh, and for one of the companies, at least now, we only know the ones who got inspect, you know, the ones because, you know, you have you have several levels. You have the patients who you order who didn't get it or it was a look freeze or manufacturing failure. The ones who were not a failure, but whenever they got the product, the product is out of specification, so they can't really sell the product. They, the patient, it, it's given for free, and so uh, and, and then we have, uh, you know, for for one of the studies that we have, you know, for the Novartis studies, everybody will be collected, the out of inspect, but the Yaskarta, they have a separate structure to collect out of spec because it's the expanded uh, process, expanded access. So uh, really, we don't know the, the denominator. So I think one of the interesting things is that the, the reporting is voluntary. Uh, so this, this collaboration that we're having with industry, both CBMTR and EBMT with these companies, it's really unprecedented um, because uh, uh, we are able to now see how many of these products are, are shipped to a center, and we know how many those centers reported to us. So that's the first stage is like what how represented is the data that you use and i think the next stage uh, to pushing a little bit this collaboration is to ask what is the failure of it because how many people order but never get it and i think that will be the intent to see um because it's a really a question of access right how many patients were helping with this product or not and and that is still a little bit of a black box but with this interaction i think we got to be able to start asking these questions uh and I think it links a little bit to the point that uh, uh, we were talking before, which is, you know, how heavily treated these patients are. Does it impact on the yield of the manufacturer of the product? And how how close the salvage therapy is to that? Because you know, you may select better your salvage therapy if that will uh, will, will will make it prohibitive the you know the the yield of of the manufacturer. So I think. So those those two questions are kind of uh, linked. So um, that that will, that will be my my comment on it. So Christian, what is the current situation when it comes to the EBMT European Registry and about the level or the granularity of data you are able to capture? I, again, it's a, it's, a, it's a very important question, and and several health technology assessment agencies are very interested in, in capturing uh, data and information on, on this aspect. So the EBMT registry is in a position to uh, capture information on patients who are uh, referred for apheresis and a fraction of those patients for the reasons that Marcello mentioned will actually never get the product either because the patient disease will evolve too fast or there will be a manufacturing failure, although this is quite rare, or we will have to deal with an out of spec uh, product. But if we go back further, uh, there are uh, a number of uh, interested parties that wish to know what fraction of the patients who could benefit from receiving those products will actually be ne never referred to. Uh, and this um, uh, brings us back to the matter of access to this new category of uh, therapies and the fact that there is a very specific hospital organization to deliver CAR T cells to candidate patients. And this is also relevant to the fact that the real world data looks 
so much similar to the results in the pivotal trials because the organization to deliver CAR T cells is not as stringent as in a clinical trial, but still require the hospitals to comply with very stringent and specific rules for organization. So there is a, a medical economic aspect and I would say a social aspect to, to CAR T cell treatments, which basically comes to the question, so how many centers do we need in a country like the USA? How many do we need in a country like Germany or France and so on? And we don't have the answer yet because we don't know what is the actual fraction of candidate patients who do get the treatment. So I have a, a question here for you, Marcello. Uh, uh, did you, uh, do you have in the uh, registry a patient who received two or several infusions of CAR T cells? And if it's the case, what was the outcome? Yeah, so it seems to be uh, uh, disease specific. Uh, we're not seeing this very much with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. But uh, we're seeing this with ALL. As you know, uh, these products were approved without sort of an assay to uh, look at the pharmacokinetics of it. You know, what is the expansion and what is the persistent? So people are really flying blind if these patients uh, relapse is because the CAR T cell didn't work or if they have a CD19 negative relapse, for example, right? So uh, what people are doing, mostly the pediatricians, they're following for B cell recovery. And they're using B-cell recovery as a uh, surrogate for persistence. So if the B-cell recovery is early, these patients are, are they are assuming, or the, the, there's a presumption that the, 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 cell, the CAR T-cells are no longer present. So what we notice is that there is a fraction of patients who are receiving more than one infusion of CAR T-cell. And, and we thought it was a mistake. So we went back because the date of collection was the same uh, for infusion one and infusion two. So we went and query, you know, uh, we asked the companies and we asked the centers. And so in fact, what happens is that if the B cell recover early, there is a assumption that these patients would relapse early. So they preemptive give another dose. And that's really relevant for young children when they have some additional aliquots of Kimraya available or, or CAR T cell, and then they have it available and then they just infuse again. Now, how long is it, the B-cell recovery? Is it 30 days, 60 days? So I think, I think we don't know yet, but these are the instances of, of trying to do this sort of a, as, as a continuation of therapy, like almost like a, a maintenance uh, to keep the B-cells low uh, or keep CAR T-cells uh, around. So I think there's a lot of questions of it and, and people are doing some unusual things without necessarily having data, but that's one of the patterns we're, we're observing. Okay. One last, last question, because we're running out of time to both of you. We have a, a nice large cohort showing that in the real life, the results are good. They reproduce, if not even better, uh, the uh, clinical trials and the registration. Uh, these uh, CAR T cells are proving to be highly effective and are life-saving in many patients. And in the uh, article, uh, when I look to the uh, survival or outcome curves, we can uh, already see some, you know, uh, plateaus. I don't know if you can see it, but definitely uh, this is something very encouraging. So with this in mind, uh, Christian Marcello, what are the next steps? For how long should we continue to collect these data and how are we going to uh, make better use of it once we have answered the first question, which is about, okay, we reproduce, uh, and this is really, I'm not minimizing, it's extremely important to do this work, but what are the remaining questions we would like to address with these kind of tools? Christian, you want to go first? Yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, I think the, the number of patients is actually uh, defined as part of the contract that the registries both, both, uh, uh, on both sides of the Atlantic have with uh, companies. So this is um, providing some reassurance uh, in terms of efficacy and safety. And uh, again, the, the um, 
safety will be monitored for 15 years. So we will still have to follow a quite large cohort of patients for an extended period of time. So that's one aspect. Uh, what can we expect in the future? We will have more CAR T cells coming to the market. We will have CAR T cells for new indications. And uh, it's very likely that we will have questions around uh, combinations of existing CAR T cells with other CAR T cells or other kind of uh, um, therapies, let's say uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors to prevent uh, CAR T cell exhaustion, to uh, counteract the uh, immune suppressive micro environment in the tumor. So the registries have values for, again, uh, uh, several stakeholders, the pharma companies, but also the health technology assessment agencies, uh, uh, FDA, EMA, and so on. So I'm, I'm, I'm very confident that by building a repository, the effort will be worth uh, for the uh, output of uh, clinically relevant information. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think that uh, um, we're seeing now the utilization of these therapies early on, the on the uh, on on the on the history of these patients. So now the at least the, the, the lymphoma will be early in a second uh, first line therapy or first uh, after the first uh, um, failure. So so that's important. In the United States, we have now the mental cell indication for this Descartes or Braxa cell. I, I, that's even harder for me to say the other the new name. And um, uh, and we're seeing now for myeloma coming through next year, uh, which would be a, a, a huge uh, and a very busy um, a set of, of different therapies available for myeloma. I think for the question is to try to understand how to best uh, apply these therapies to these patients, the timing of it, uh, minimizing toxicity. We're seeing that people are trying to use tosuluzumab much earlier to decrease the severity of CRS. Some, pe some people are offering doing prevention, doing tosuluzumab along with the infusion. So there's a lot of things to learn to make these products safer uh, to patients. So I think we're just scratching the surface here. I think this is really good. And I think, uh, uh, you know, both EBMT and CNTR did a lot of work to try to put together a structure that can answer these questions. So I think we're really well prepared and positioned uh, to do this. And I think this is really very exciting for, for all of us in the field. Well, that was a wonderful conclusion, uh, Marcello. Thank you very much. Both of you, I think, this was really a fascinating uh, discussion, and I believe uh, the stem cell transplant and cellular therapy uh, field is really on the forefront of innovation. 30, 40 years ago, actually 1957, first publication by Don Thomas, uh, stem cell transplantation where nobody, apparently I wasn't born, uh, believed can save lives. Today we know that this first generation of cellular therapy, this is how I call it, allogenic stem cell transplantation uh, saved and continues to save thousands of lives. And here I'll take this opportunity to say a big hello and acknowledgement to, I can see among our attendees, Professor Manuel Abicassis from Portugal, uh, who has actually introduced stem cell transplantation to Portugal. Hello, Manuel. Uh, uh, so definitely, I can see also my co-chair, uh, of the Academy, Professor Nagler, who has the largest experience of CAR T cells in ALL, actually in adult ALL worldwide. Hi, Arnon, how are you? I hope everything is okay with, in this COVID situation. So definitely uh, saving lives, first generation of uh, uh, stem cell transplant, and now the CAR T cell field truly breaks through. It took 30 years because when we look to the literature, first publication, uh, late 80s, early 90s, approval 2017. So sometimes, but this is moving so fast. And in a few days, we can see at the ASH meeting, not all the CAR T cells coming in myeloma, uh, but other diseases. But now, even before the approval or the wider use of CAR T cells, we have bispecific antibodies challenging the use of CAR T cells. So this is really fascinating. Uh, I have really enjoyed this discussion with you guys. So thank you very much. You. And to all our audience, thank you for your participation. Thank you for all your questions, for your interactions. I do apologize if I wasn't able to take all your questions. Of course, 
uh, I couldn't, you know, name every participant about uh, among the few hundreds. This is why uh, I thought to just uh, acknowledge uh, two pioneers in the field, Professor Abikasis and Professor Nagda, but there are many other colleagues uh, watching us. So thank you very much. Thank you for being loyal uh, to the uh, IACH Journal Club. Hope you will have a wonderful uh, ASH virtual meeting, but it's promising to be a superb one. Uh, probably we'll have another journal club before the end of the year, but if you're not going to follow our next journal club after ASH, well, then I wish you all some wonderful end of the year holidays despite the COVID-19 pandemic, and please stay safe and keep well. Thank you very much. And wherever you, you are, much. thank you. Care. Thank you, Mohamed. Thank you, Marcello. Thank you, ISCH. Thank you. Bye-bye. Take care.